everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. I'm very happy about our guest today. He's a returned guest and his testimony expands further from when we last left off. He, as you remember, or hopefully you guys who have been here, remember that he had a visitation from Lucifer face to face. When he rejected Lucifer, he actually was assigned to be assassinated by his uncle. After that, his mother had repeated dreams of another way he would be assassinated, but by a family member. So the devil put a hit out on him. And then years later down the line, the Lord gave him money out of thin air. You're going to want to hear this. And it's so much more to the story. So hang around, Joe Sanchez. Thank you so much for being with us today. Amen. Praise the Lord, sister. Thank you for having me back on the show again. Thank you so much. So Joe, how has life been for you since our last interview? Well, I've been truly, truly, truly blessed. Um, spiritually, I've, I've, my walk with Jesus uh, has been, I, you know what? There's no really words to describe how amazing Jesus is to me. But I started a podcast and, and it's been uplifting to me. And the Lord has been dealing with me and my wife and, and the things that are going to come in our, you know, you know, for Jesus will, for his will. And I just look forward to whatever the Lord has. Him. And again, here I am with you. I'm blessed and honored. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> here I am again. And I, I just feel honored. When I didn't know when I was t talking to people, because I talked to people all over the streets, churches, I didn't know that. But when Lucifer said he had them in bondage and, and chains, unbreakable chains, because I would tell them about Jesus and just the way I talked to people, he couldn't hold them no more. And I, I didn't know that was pot. I didn't know until. And anyway, so when I refused the deal from Lucifer, uh, he promised to kill me. He promised, you know, and he sent all those demons into the house. And and uh, but the Lord protected me that night. And um, so I refused saying, and, and I had the best sleep of my life that night, <laughs> only one night. But uh, so now here comes forward. So after that, you know, I, I go to church, I serve Jesus and I'm a young man. So I said that at that time I was around 15 years old. Well, I don't remember it was at the same time around 15, I probably was because next time, uh, next thing I know, I never went home, you guys know, because it was so violent and evil. I never went home. And I have uh, family members. My mom kept us away from all family members. We never were around them because a lot of them were really bad men, really bad. So one day I come home and I see my uncle, a really, really a bad person. And then the next thing I find out, he's living with us. And I'm like, huh? Why would he live here? And we had a small little trailer in the backyard and it fit one person. And they put him there. Now, my uncle was a very, very evil man. He was a heroin addict. You could see he had all these tattoos and you could see the needle marks. And, and he was a very violent man, evil. Just So I, I didn't want to be home because of what's going on. And now he's there. I definitely didn't want to be there. So when he was there, he will come up to me. He says, Joe, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. Mm -mm, I didn't want to talk to him. I will always go to church and come all hours at late at night. And he will, will always want to come talk to me. And I never wanted to talk to him until one night. So I'm coming home. You know, I'll go to church and it's late at night. And he's sitting down on the kitchen table. I walk in the house and he looks at me. He goes, we're going to talk tonight. And I said, okay, he had his heart of liquor. He's pouring his glass and he's sitting down and he's a very evil man. And I sit down face to face and he goes, do you know why I'm here? And I said, no, Theo. He goes, I'm here for you. He goes, I was sent here for you. And as soon as he said those words, I knew who it was from. It was from Lucifer. And he's tried to tell me that I need to join and, and, and join Satan, serve Satan. Because if, if I do not turn my life over to Satan, he was going to have to hurt me. And then I said, you mean kill me? He goes, yes. He goes, I'll send you. And he goes, please. He's trying to tell me. I said, uncle, please 
sir. He goes, he's powerful. I said, no, he's not. I go, I will, I will never serve Satan and his demon. I, I hate them. I will never serve them. I go, he already made an offer to me. And I said no to his face. And he goes, I'm telling you, you have to join. I said, no. So he's drinking. He, he's, he pours the drink. I go, you know who I serve? I serve the Lord and mighty Jesus Christ. Watch this. As he pours his drink, puts down the hard liquor. I put my hand over his glass. I go, in the name of Jesus Christ, turn this into water. Lord, show him who I serve. I serve a King Jesus in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I said, now drink it. I said, drink it now. And he gets his cup and he looks at it. He sniffs it. He looks at me, takes a sip. He goes, what did you do to my alcohol? And he goes and he pours it in the sink. He doesn't remember, it's late. It's around midnight, something like that. And he comes back and he's angry. Don't you ever touch my alcohol. I said, what happened? He goes, you know what you did. I said, no, I serve King Jesus. I will never serve Satan. And he goes, you know, I want to show you something. He goes, come with me. So I follow him to the, remember, we were in the house in the kitchen. So we go to the backyard so, and, and around the fence, it's the trailer, and uh, it had a couple steps, and then I had my, my, my step that was a barber, and he had an old barber chair that he would cut my hair, and sometimes people will come over, he'll cut their hair, and my deal goes, sit in the chair, so we're face, face to face, so I sit on the chair, it has that handle, you know, the bars, and I put them down, and he's talking to me, and I go, Jesus, I don't know what's going to happen. I go, I'm just, I'm just Lord, I, I'm trusting you. I don't know what's going to happen. And he sits down and he goes, I want you to do something for me. And I said, okay. And he goes, if I look this way, he goes, look at my eyes. If I look up, look at my eyes. If I look down, look at my eyes. And I, he goes, do you understand? I said, yeah, just look at your eyes. I, I, I don't I didn't get it. What's, what, look at his eyes. He goes, if I turn around, look at your eyes. I'm like, oh, all right. So I'm like this, sitting down, and he's he's talking to me. He's telling me I have to join Lucifer. I, I have to join, or he's gonna have to kill me. And he's saying that I have powers and gifts. I said, no, no. I said, I it's gifts. They're not powers. The enemy uses that word. I don't do that. So when I'm I'm when he's talking to me, next thing you know, I can't move my body. I couldn't move my arm. I'm like just stuck. And then I have my heart starts to get, and I'm like, Jesus, he tricked me. He tricked me. I'm stuck like this. My, I couldn't feel my arms or my legs, nothing. I was completely like, I don't know the words where people say they're paralyzed. I couldn't feel nothing. I couldn't move. I couldn't. And I didn't want him to see fear in my eyes, and I started praying, I said, in my heart, and he's looking at me, and I go, Jesus, get me loose, get me loose, I said, I didn't know this is a, a trick, and he starts laughing evil, and next thing you know, I saw the demons, I saw demons all around him, I saw the demons inside of him, and I go, they're going to kill, I, I'm going to get killed right here, so i like, Jesus, I'm going to be killed, I go, let me loose, let me loose, Jesus, I didn't know this was a trick, and he goes, you know what I have to do to you if you don't serve Satan? I says, I said, then I'll die for, for Jesus. And as I'm still, I'm, I'm scared. And next thing you know, I got loose. I got loose. And when I, I jumped up, he's still sitting down. I says, I will never serve Satan. Never. I'll never serve that loser. And I says, by the way, you're gone. You're not going to live here no more. And remember, I'm just from 15 years old. And he goes, and I, I start to walk away. I, um, because we're face to face. He goes, come here now. I said, no, kill me. I'd rather die for Jesus. As I was walking, he comes up right behind me. And I told Jesus this. I go, Jesus, I'm not going to turn around. I'm not going to defend myself. I'm going to let him kill me for you, Lord Jesus. I'd rather die and go home and be with you, Jesus. So when he comes up right behind me, I'm waiting to be stabbed, hit over the head. He comes up right behind me. And I'm walking. I said, Jesus. You, you, I'm coming home or you defend me. I'm not going to look at, I have no guns, no weapons. This is called faith. Faith without works is dead. I know who I serve. So when he comes up right behind me and I, I, I'm ready for the impact or the knife or whatever, 
Next thing you know, I hear the sound like a wind, picks him up, throws him all the way across the yard. He flies on top of it. We had a couple lawnmowers set up, lands on it like this. And I turn around. I was like, wow. I go, what happened? And he's on top of the lawnmowers like this. And he goes, you know what you did? And I go out to him. He goes, don't touch me. Don't touch me. And I go, I go out. He goes, you have powers. You don't know. I said, you're wrong. I have Jesus. <laughs> I have Jesus. And I go, I'm going to pick you up. He goes, don't know. I said, I'm picking you up in the name of Jesus Christ. I pick him up. And I says, you're still leaving tomorrow. You are not going to live here in the name of Jesus Christ. And I go in the house. I'm like, wow. When Jesus saved my life, he was about to kill me in the backyard where I live. And remember, this is my mom's brother. This is my mom's brother, older brother. So watch this. So I go to bed. I pray. I give Jesus glory. So I get up next morning. I go, Jesus, how am I going to tell my mom? Remember, mom, if you guys know my life story, it's very violent, evil, no Jesus at all. So I will never forget this. So I go, Jesus, I, I'm going to just go do it. So I go and knock on my mom's door. And this must have been around Saturday morning now. This is when I said that I went to work. So it's just me and my little sister, my uncle in the backyard, in the trailer, and my mom's in the room. And I'll never forget my mom says, come in. And she's sitting at the edge of the bed. I go, Mom, I don't tell my mom what happened. Okay, I don't say nothing. I go, Mom. And she goes, yes, me. I go, Theo's not going to live here no more. I already told him what you're going to do is you're going to go get his suitcase. You're going to get his clothes. You're going to put it in the trunk. You're going to get in the car. We're all going to get in the car. I said, I'm going to sit with Theo because nothing's going to happen to you or to anybody. I'm going to make sure nobody gets hurt. I said, I'm going to sit with him and we're going to take him all the way to Fresno and drop him off wherever he wants to go in the name of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to come back. And watch this. This is why Jesus is amazing. My mom go, looks at me. She goes, okay, me home. I'm like, are you kidding me? My mom, listen, no, no, but me, not okay. I was like, Jesus. So she goes, and I follow my mom because my, my deal is very violent, violent. And, he's, and, and she goes and gets a suitcase, and he's freaking out. Oh, yeah, how can you listen to this kid? He's this punk kid. How can you listen? I told mom, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Just just get it. I got the suitcase. My mom packed it. I put it in the, in the trunk. I told mom, get in the car. Get in the car. And my sister, get in the front seat. Get in up there. And I grabbed my uncle. He goes, I'll get in myself. And he started to I said, no, in the name of Jesus Christ, I had to kind of force him into the back seat. And I get in there and I'm right next to him. And he goes, I can't believe you're listening to this kid. He goes, how can you listen to this minor? And I told my mom, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. And my mom goes, where would you like to go? And she's scared. And, he, and he's throwing it to I go, mom, just start driving to Fresno. And my mom didn't take freeway. She took the, the service streets because she was wasn't scared of, scared of driving. But anyways, so we're driving. It goes to Larry, Visalia, Fresno. So we're going, and we go to Visalia, the very next town. And my mom, I, I mean, my my uncle is freaking out, mad, and now he's starting to get really, really agitated. Where you could tell he won't maybe want to start hitting violence. So we get to the famous in Visalia, it's called the Oval, which is a big circle to park. And I told mom, pull over right here now in the name of Jesus Christ. And my mom pulls off. It what blows my mind. And this is Jesus. Everything I said, remember, my mom did it. She didn't question nothing. She pulls over. I get out. I, 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 I get the, his suitcase out. I put him. I grab him. I, say, I always say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pull him out. And I stand him on the street, and he's screaming and holler. I says, Jesus loves you. God bless you. Good luck. I get in the car, and I go, Mom, try, 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 try. And my mom takes off, and we come back to, to, to Larry. Never seen him or ever heard from him ever again. Wow. That's The devil sent him to, to kill me. I said, no. I said, no. I'll say no to a thousand times. I cannot stand Lucifer or his demons. 
I love Jesus. Jesus saved me. Then what's another miracle is that my mom listened to everything I said as a 15 year old kid. And it, was, it, it just blows my mind as I think about it. And I, it goes through my mind how amazing Jesus was. And he still is. If we're his children. He protects us. He guides us. I was scared. I didn't think my mom would do any of that. I didn't think she would listen, but she did because it was Jesus. And I, I, I give all the honor and glory to Jesus. I love him. And that's what happened when the, my uncle was sent to kill me and Jesus protected me. So I have a few questions for you. Let's go back a bit. So okay. you said that you would come home late at night. How did your mother feel about you coming home late at night? Or was that not an issue? It's kind of weird because my mom would never say anything to me. It's like she wanted me gone because it was so violent at home and the abuse. And I don't talk about it because it was really, it's hard to talk about what my mom went through. And I, we all saw it as kids, me and my sisters and, and my whole life. So when I was there, you know, when I got older, I, I wanted to stop this violence. And so what happened is, I would see my mom sometimes looking through a window and I will walk home sometimes one or two in the morning. Sometimes I didn't even come home because I didn't want to be around the violence. And not only that, the demon attacks. And I was here, look through the window. And as soon as she sees me, she run in the room and, and I, we never talked. It was, why are you coming home late? Where were you? Nothing. I, I, that was the relationship I had. And I feel like I look back now that that's what she wanted because I wasn't there to see. That's why I never wanted to be home because it was so evil and violent. Wow. So did you ever want her to ask you, you know, why are you home so late or it didn't cross your mind? You know, I knew because it was the lifestyle she, she chose to live and, and go through. And I, I'm going to tell you this one part. It got so bad that when I I turned 17 and I said, I'm not going to let him hurt my mom no more since I was a little kid, since five years old, because he came into our life since I was five years old. So w- one day he started beating my mom again. You could hear my mom screaming and I started banging on the door this time. I said, I'm not going to take this no more. And he said, what's going on? I said, I need to speak to you. This is my stepdad. He goes, and mama goes, no, I mean, we'll just go to Sister Gloria's house. Just go away. So she could get beaten like a dog. And I banged on the door. I said, no, I need to speak to him now. And she goes, please, me, hold just leave. I said, no, I, I can't take this no more. It's going to stop today. So he opens the door. My mom goes around and she grabs my little sister and during the back door open and she's holding my little sister and she's crying. She's ready, been beaten. And I stop it. And he goes, he looks, I'm face to face with them. And he's looking at me. He goes, what do you want? I says, you're not going to hit my mom no more. I says, if it makes you feel like a man, pretend I'm my mom. I says, but you're not going to hurt her no more. I can't take it. And he raised the beer bottle, he grabbed the beer bottle, he raised it, and he was going to smash it over my head. And I said, if that makes you feel like a man, then do it. My mom screamed with all her heart, no, not my son. And my sister's crying, and he raised it. And I said, I'm, you know, this man was never a father. He raised it, and he's about to do it, and he stops. And my mom comes crying. He goes in the room. My mom grabs me. She goes, just leave. Just go to Cisco's Gloria's house. We'll watch what happens. I go to Cisco. I tell Cisco what happened. I go home at night, late at night. And then this happened at 6 o'clock in the morning the next day. My mom turns on the light. And she goes, Joe. My mom's never said my name like that. It's always me home. And I'm in sleep. She goes, Joe. Wake up now. I'm like, oh. She goes, get your stuff, the other word, and get the F out of my house now. I go, what? She goes, get your stuff, the other word, and get the F out of my house now. 
Joe. I, I, I just turned 17 and, and she goes, get out now. So I grabbed a bag of clothes. I went to Sister Gloria's yard and I fell asleep in the front yard. I cried. Sister Gloria opened the door and she saw me there. I tell her, she couldn't believe it. She goes, you're such a good kid. You All you do is search. All you do, and I said, and and that was the very first time I became homeless, and the pastor opened, this was 17, and then I slept in the church, and I went to school, and um, now I got a part-time job, and but that's, that's why I never had a relation with my mom, and that was, there's nothing I could say, because she chose that life, and chose that over kids, or since we were little, all our life, so I've never had a relationship with my mom. I'm sorry. I didn't know that part. And I did wonder before, how come you would always be in Sister Gloria's yard from mm-hmm. our last interview? So that explains it. I'm really sorry that happened to you. Yeah, um, it's, it's okay. Okay. So let's go over to your uncle. So when your uncle came to stay with you, was he in witchcraft? Because why would he try to convert you over to it? Or was he just possessed? No, um, that's a good question. Like I said before, um, I don't know if I said it with you, but I, I've been talking so much about my life. In the history tree of my family, there was a lot of witches and warlocks in my family tree. To be honest, I, I believe he practiced it. He, excuse me. He did all that. Um, he was obedient to Satan. And like I said, he told me things I won't say ever, uh, bad things. And it's just evil. You know, and and I saw I didn't want to be part of I didn't want to be around him, and I just knew about the family tree, was all, and that's why my mom kept us away, which I thank Jesus for that. But so he was just obedient, and you know he came out of nowhere, and I was shocked that he was living there, and I didn't know it was for me the whole time. Was your stepfather living there at the same time when your uncle mm-hmm. was there? Mm-hmm. And, and he didn't mind him staying there. Oh, he, everybody was scared of him. My stepdad was scared of him. The, the, he was a very violent man. And my mom was scared of him. Everybody's scared. He comes and shows up. I'm living here. And <laughs> they're like, okay, you can stay in the trailer. And then I come home and I find out he's living here. I'm like, why would, in my head, why would you allow him here? But like I said, this is why I found out later it was for me. The wow. devil sent him. Wow. And then how about the time when, like you said, you're in the kitchen with him and he pours his alcohol and you pray mm-hmm. over it for it to become water. What did it become? What happened to it? Uh, did you say? You know, all I, all, it was like, uh, it was white. It was clear. And I'm just staring at him. I pray over it. He, he looks at me. He looks at his alcohol and he sniffs it. He takes a little sip and he gets furious, gets up and pours it out. He goes, Would you ever touch my alcohol again? I go, What the, what happened? I want you know, I'm like, tell me. and he goes, You know what you did? I'm like, they never tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> but I know it turned into water, and that's what he says. Hey, come with me outside. And so, like I said, what happened? <laughs> so it's like the reversal when Jesus turned water into wine, you turned yeah, I know, I thought the same thing water. Okay, so how about the time when you were in the trailer? You guys went out to the trailer, and he said, wherever mm-hmm. I look, look at my eyes. So yeah. do you believe he hypnotized you? No, he didn't hypnotize me. Um, because remember, there's demons everywhere, right? So the devil is using him to get me to either convert or kill me right there. So all the forces, remember, when he started laughing, I saw all the demons inside him and around him. So somehow the demons got a hold of me and they held me and I couldn't feel nothing. And I, I even I tried to move in front of him without him seeing I was struggling. And I go, I go, he's going to kill me right here. And I started praying. I said, Jesus, I said, I didn't know he tricked me. And then the Lord released me. He got me free. And as soon as I moved, I jumped up and I says, Satan's a loser. He'll always be a loser. He's going to the lake of fire. I said, I'm going to only serve Jesus. I'm willing to die for Jesus. And that's when he goes, come here now. And he, and like I said, the rest of my testimony comes up right behind me. And Jesus had angels throw him all the way across the yard. I, I, I heard 
like because he was about to start. I heard this like just win, like come up, and, and I, it was like probably the angel wings. I'm picturing my head the angel wings, and just came in. I mean, literally, he's right behind me, and I closed my eyes as I'm walking. I said, "This is it." I told I told Jesus, I'm not going to defend myself. I'm not even going to turn around. I'll die for Jesus. And the angels picked him up, threw him all the way across the lawn, on top of the lawnmowers. So that probably is what scared them to be like, I'm not going to fight anymore to stay here because he has invisible <laughs> angels, agents um, fighting for him. So let's go on to when uh, you saw a scary man in the shadows and he... Yeah. You and him had some kind of interaction. Yeah, so I'm a very bold person. I, I'll go around, Jesus loves you, God bless you, Jesus loves you. I, I do it to this day, you know, I, I'm just because I love Jesus and it's part of me. So as a kid, remember, this is, I never know the ages. I was so young, 14, 15, around there. So I always, like I said, I always walked home late at night, all hours of the night, or sometimes I didn't go home, and I had my Bible in church and church clothes and and i'm walking and as i'm walking this guy comes out of the shadows and i saw him and scared me this guy was big i mean just muscles and and he the way he looked at me I, i'll tell you it looked like a demon and he just like staring at me and i'm like I could feel the chills and the fear. And I go, this is of the devil. So I'm walking and I go, God bless you. And he goes, what did you say? As soon as he said that, I walked right past him. My heart, the hair, everything. I'm like, and I know normal people would have just kept walking, but not this Joe Sanchez. I had to turn around and he goes, Say it one more time and see what happens to you. And I said, I paused. <laughs> My heart's like this. I go, Jesus, I feel like this is a challenge from the devil. I got to I got to accept this challenge. So I'm a, he is big muscles, like bodybuilders, just pure muscle. His fist was the biggest in my head. And I go up to him and he goes, say it, see what happens. And I walk right up to him. And I, the Lord gives me things and I, I just react. So I look down at his feet. There's a little gap between us. And I go, in the name of Jesus Christ, I draw a line, imaginary line, in the name of Jesus Christ, right in front of him. And he looks down and he looks at me and I go, in the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, all right, Jesus. And he goes, and he gets his fist. He cocks it back like this. He goes, say it. And I said, okay. I go, I'm going to die for Jesus. This is where, where my heart is pounding so fast. I'm scared. He raised his man. This is the middle of nighttime. It's dark. In the middle of the street. I, I've never seen this guy in my life. He's big. He raised his fist. And remember, this, he showed me his fist right in front of me. It's big. It goes like this. And I go, Jesus loves you. And I go like this <laughs> because I'm waiting for the impact. I go like this and I, I'm waiting for the fist. And I'm like, my heart. And I look up and he goes, you're crazy. And walks away. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Jesus. I go, my Jesus is awesome. Awesome. And I praise the Lord. I walked all the way home and I was just praising Jesus. But to me, that was a challenge of my faith, who I love, and I had to take that challenge. And I've never seen that guy ever again, but that's what happened. Wow. And that's the perfect example of walking in faith and <laughs> having Jesus protect you in everything. <laughs> uh, every, and I didn't have no weapons. I didn't have no guns or not, or karate, nothing. I'm like, every time, you, you heard my testimony, my whole life was like, I think I'm going home now, Jesus. And always Jesus protected me, saved me. Perfect time. Every time. Jesus is amazing. Okay. So tell us about the time when you were homeless and you had an assignment from the Lord to do something where you were not supposed to go into work. Even though you were homeless, you needed that money. Tell us what happened. So this is a time where I, 
right before the, uh, my last testimony we heard, the guy gets out of prison and then, and then we were together and then Jesus saved me from him and I brought me to Arizona. So this was before he got out of prison. So I, I'm, I'm living with the pastor, I'm 20 years old and I worked for his son because the pastor's helping me. So I work for the pastor. He's a landscaper. So I was having, I think, like a bowl of cereal and I'm washing the dishes uh, because I'm ready to go to work. And and his worker was going to come pick me up and we go do the accounts. So as I'm washing the dishes, Jesus speaks to me through the Holy Ghost. He goes, you're not going to work for me. I mean, you're not going to work today. You're going to I have a mission for you. And I, as I'm washing dishes and I heard this, I'm like, I hear that. that that's not from Je-. And Jesus. Said, yes, that was for me. And you did hear me. And I'm like, Jesus, I'm homeless. I go, they're coming to pick me up right now. How am I? You know, they don't believe me. What's that going to look like if I leave and I, I'm homeless and the son is picking me up to work for him? I go, and Jesus says, okay. Go get a paper and a pen. So it's okay. I get a paper and pen, and she says, you write everything I tell you. I say, yes, Jesus. So I sit down at the kitchen table, and Jesus tells me word by word the letter for the pastor and the pastor's son. And I say, okay. And I write it down. And, the name, and, of course, it says, if you don't believe me, ask Jesus, you know. And I love it. I write it down. I put it down, and Jesus says, okay. Walk across the street. There's a park, and it goes down. And, I, and Jesus don't tell me nothing. Jesus doesn't give me no what's going on, who I'm going to meet or see. Or and I said, okay. And the Lord says, go now. I said, okay. I leave the note. I, I head across the street. I'm walking across the park. I walk and come to the street. And I go, which way, Lord? Left, right? Jesus will say, go left. Uh, it's in Tulare Hospital where you, you walk down the street. And I'm walking. And I'm like, Lord, who am I going to see me? Remember, Jesus don't tell me nothing. And then I was waiting and Jesus says, someone's waiting for you. I go, really? Someone waiting for me? Me? So I'm like, okay, okay. So I'm, I'm walking, I'm walking. And the Lord says, he's right up there. I'm looking. Where? I, I, now I'm just going to walk a little faster. I want to see who it is. And as I come cl- closer, I see this, this old man in common at home. And he's in a wheelchair. He has the shades on and he's he's like like waiting for somebody. He's like this. Like so I see him. I thought, oh, he's probably waiting for family members or whatever. And I go, hey, that can't be him. So I'm walking, walking, about five feet in front of him. Because before I said that, I said, like, Jesus, that's him. Go up to him, introduce yourself to him. And I look at him, I said, that can't be him. And I, as I walk up five feet away, I turn right. And I go, that's not him. And I walk away and Jesus says, stop now. And when Jesus, when you upset Jesus, I, I've done it a few times and it's not fun. He goes, stop, turn around and you go up to him and introduce yourself to him now. And when Jesus said that to me, I stopped right away. Trust me. And I go, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I turn around and, this is, and I walk up to this man. And he's like this, like this. And I go up to him. I didn't know he was blind. I didn't know. And I go, excuse me, sir. And he goes, yes, yes, yes. I, and I'm like, oh, he's blind. And I go, I just, my name is Joe Sanchez, and Jesus sent me to come talk to you. As soon as I did that, that man started to cry, cry. And it touched my heart. I'm looking at him. And he goes, you know what happened? And he tells me. That he lives in that common lesson home. He served Jesus his whole life and the Lord used him. He goes around and talks to people in the common lesson home. Nobody wants to talk about Jesus. He talks to the co-worker, the workers that work there, like clean them up and feed them. Nobody wants to talk about Jesus. Nobody serves Jesus but him. When he woke up, He says, Jesus, I want you to send me a man of God this morning. I want to have a a conversation about you, Jesus. I want to have fellowship with the man of God. So he had the the employees roll him out to the edge of the street. 
and then they're locked, and all he was like this, waiting for a man of God to show up that Jesus sent. And when he told me that, it melted my heart. I'm like, Jesus, I'm a man of God. I go, me? And here I am, want to be selfish and want to go work for what? Here's a man hurting in the worst way, wants a relationship with Jesus, talk to somebody about Jesus. And Jesus says, I have a mission for you, you for 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 me for Jesus and I was so stubborn and wanted to block it off because I was thinking about myself money uh being responsible and, I, and there's nothing wrong with that I'm talking about doing the Lord's will it's over your own personal interests your own personal desires your goals Jesus comes first he's my king so he goes after he's crying I cry with him we pray, we talk about Jesus. He goes, would you go in the room with me? I say, yeah. I, 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 I roll him into his room. We spent the entire day talking about Jesus. And he told me amazing testimonies. We cried. We talked about Jesus. The workers were coming. Oh, who is this? He goes, this is a man of God. Jesus said. <laughs> it was awesome. So when it got later around, I don't know, I want to say four or five o'clock. I, I, I don't, I'll leave, I'll come back and visit you a few times. And he says, okay, we prayed. And it, it was an amazing, amazing experience. As I'm walking, I leave, I'm walking back to the house. And Jesus says, thank you, son. I love you, son. When Jesus said that, I, I can't begin to tell you. Jesus thanking me. For, for doing something that I almost said no. Oh, I didn't hear you, Jesus. I, I was embarrassed of myself for Jesus and to tell me Jesus loves me for doing that. It touched my heart. And then I'm walking and now I'm thinking about the no, because remember, nobody believes that Jesus talks to me. Nobody believes. And, and this is how amazing Jesus is. I'm walking and Jesus is talking to me and he's thanking me. And I said, I love you, Jesus. I, I, again, I said, I'm sorry. And Jesus says, he knew I was worried about that note about the pastor and the pastor's son. And Jesus says, son, I already took care of it. I go, well, you did? He said, everything is taken care of, son. You don't have to worry about a thing. I go, really? So I walk to the pastor's house. I go in, I'm, I'm kind of nervous, you know, and I remember the pastor and the pastor's wife, they're eating dinner because, you know, the elderly, they eat early. And I walk in and I saw the note is right there, the corner right next to the pastor. And I go, uh, pastor, I, 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 about the note, he goes, brother Joe, everything is okay. Don't worry about it. I didn't have to explain. And I go, then I even said, he goes, Brother Joe, everything is taken care of. You don't have to explain everything. Everything is okay. <laughs> Tell me how amazing Jesus is. When Jesus tells you, you're not going to go to work today. And you're like, but my butt, no. King, what, what, what does it say? What's impossible by man is possible by Jesus. He is the alpha, the mega, all-knowing, all-powerful. You don't think Jesus can fix it? Oh, <laughs> trust me. But that was an amazing experience. And I thank Jesus that I look past myself and I listen. And that was an amazing experience. That's, that's what happened, sister. And you know what? It's amazing what obedience can bring. It, it yes. provides blessings, protection, provision. And that note was obviously provision. So where did the note come from? We know it came from Jesus, but mm -hmm. does the past, did the pastor know who brought it to him or? Well, well, it was amazing because it said on the note, it was from Jesus, you know, and I wrote everything down word by word that was from Jesus. And, and I even asked the pastor, I go, pastor, and he looks at me and he goes, Brother Joe, you could have you could have that note. I said, Really? You don't want it? He goes, That was word by word from, from Jesus. And I wish I ha I had it, but I struggled. If you guys know my life, I struggle in adult age and 20s and 30s. I lost everything because I've been homeless five times in my life or more. I've been through a lot. So I've lost absolutely everything. And I used to have that letter. And I wish I still had it because it was word by word from Jesus.
to whoever was going to read it, to the pastor, pastor's son. It was amazing. I wish I had that letter, but that was from Jesus. Wow. That was so miraculous. Now, so when you say you hear, or when you heard uh, Jesus say, go and talk to this person, was it audible for you or was it in your spirit? It, it, yeah, through the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So when you speak, I, I could hear him inside really clear, but I'm like, no, that ain't Jesus. And he's like, yes, that's me. <laughs> so did you keep in contact with him after? Yes, I actually did. I, I will go visit him. Um, it, it was it was awesome until Jesus saved me and brought me because I was right before the guy came out of prison. And, and then after that, Jesus saved me and brought me to Arizona. But I got to spend a little time with him. I went back and it, it was a just to see the glow on his face. Every time I walk in the room, I said, remember, he's blind. So praise the Lord, brother. <gasps> brother John. He would get so so excited and we will talk about Jesus for hours just man I what a blast I know he's in heaven and I'll, I'll see him there when I go home but Jesus is amazing what he does for us that is so awesome Joe I mean and the fact that you were probably the only true visitor coming to see him and yes. it was what is our desire too Jesus let's yes. talk about Jesus. amen wow. amen okay so Joe let's talk about the time when you were hungry, didn't have any money, and Jesus gave you money out of thin air, almost thin air. <laughs> this is awesome. I, I when I tell you these testimonies, I'm reliving them. I feel Jesus right now. I feel the Holy. This is what happened. This was why when people says, "Why you?" My whole life, why you love Jesus so much, Joe? Can you see why? So, the church was apostolic, and it was Mexican. So. They always had Mexican food after Sunday uh, morning service. The so ladies will make, you know, rice, beans, Mexican food. It'd be like 75 cents for a plate, 85 cents with a you know, fruit punch. I never had money, never had money ever. I was poor. My mom never gave me money, never, never had money. So, you know, so I went to church and after church, everybody would go to the kitchen and it was a big I don't know what we call dining hall tables and and everybody would go and buy food and I just go up, <laughs> it's gonna be funny, and I just stand there by the food line and just stare and people are like, Mio, you don't have no money? You hungry? So everybody always bought me food. The ladies, the pastor, ministers, and and so my I just go and stand there. <laughs> like a beggar but you know i'm like i'm hungry <laughs> and and people will buy me food all the time well it came to one time i'm up there and the sisters goes me oh you're hungry mm -hmm. do you have any money no and then i was it then you they, i was waiting for them and you yeah, well, but no and then everybody's buying food and i'm right there and nobody buys me food i'm like i'm hungry and i go Jesus, I'm hungry. So we they had a payphone inside the church, the, the kitchen, right in front of the kitchen, and where all the tables people eat. So everybody's buying the food and eating it. And and I I go to the payphone, I go, Jesus, I'm hungry. I go, can I? Can I have 85 cents? So I pick up the phone. I said, I'm gonna call you, Jesus. I pick up the payphone and I dial. Jesus Christ on the payphone. And I go, Jesus, can I have 85 cents so I can eat in the name of Jesus Christ? And as soon as I hang it up, 85 cents come down. I put my hand in there. I pull out three quarters and a dime. And the, and the ladies saw it. They're like this. They're watching me. And I go, I go, oh, thank you, Jesus. And, and the lady goes, who, who gave you money? I go, Jesus. I, I asked Jesus to give me 85 to talk about. I go, here you go, man. Can I have my food now? And she's still in a state of shock. And, and she gives me the food. And pot. I go down. Thank you, Jesus. She goes. They, they get the ladies. And she gets the pastor. They're looking at the payphone. They, they don't want to believe our mighty King Jesus can feed a teenager, get hungry, ask Jesus for a miracle and Jesus provide and it happened one other time Jesus is amazing 
If you're pure and you have a sincere heart, he will come to you. He'll meet you wherever you are. That's why I love him because he always did things throughout my whole entire life like that. And so when people say, how do you know Jesus is real? Please. One, he took me to heaven. I saw him face to face. <laughs> Changed my life. So, but these are miracles my whole life I experienced. And it blows my mind when I talk about it because it's, it happened to me. I'm thankful. I'm grateful. And I want everybody to know Jesus loves you. He's real. And all you have to do is ask him to come into your heart and he will change your life wherever you're at. Amen. And I feel like your testimony is the perfect example because you still, it appears that you still walk with a childlike faith. And that's something that Jesus mm -hmm doesn't want us to lose. He even told that to his yes. disciples, you know? So I commend you. And I feel like <laughs> every Christian, honestly, every child of God should be like this because we're his child. So we're supposed to see him as a provider, whatever we need to be there. And mm. then Jesus was there for you because you trusted him. You loved him. Yes. Um, so back to that phone booth, were they looking inside for more change? <laughs> they, were, they were looking, they were hanging up, they were pushing buttons. They were doing everything they can. But but did it's they okay. praise he, Jesus after once they realized that? No, he, he, you know what? I, I never, what I went through, nobody ever believed me. I just left alone. I just had my relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, it was something that the Lord did for me. And he did a couple of times. And, and Jesus is amazing. You know, he always took care of me. And when people, yes, it hurt. But when, when Jesus talks to you and he goes, son, I love you. I'm here with you. All that hurt goes away. I, I love Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So all this happened in California. Now you're mm -hmm. in Arizona, but mm -hmm. it wasn't just, Hey, let me pick up my stuff and move to Arizona. Something happened for you to even get to where you are right now. Tell us that story. Yes. Yeah, so, so the guy gets out of prison and, and you guys hear my past testimony with deep believer with Jennifer and so at this time, he's getting violent. He hears Jesus speaks to me. And I said, we're going to go our separate. So we're going to go to church to get, you know, same church and serve Jesus. But you stay away. And, I, and because he was getting violent, I saw the demon inside him. No one believed me. I warned the pastor, ministers. Nobody believed me. And this is the guy who tried to kill you late. first, right? This is yes. the guy who tried to kill you in that house. Yes. Yes. So this, yeah, this is the same guy, the same guy that was obedient to Satan to kill me. And, and Jesus literally made me invisible, <laughs> saved my life that night. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. So he turned his life over to Jesus. He, he, he goes to prison and he comes out. He's baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he wears a white shirt. He has all these tattoos, but he turns his life over to Jesus. And, and he has amazing testimony. And But I saw the demon. And I went to the pastor. I went to the ministers. And I said, hey, he needs help. You know, we, we could anoint him and rebuke the demon out of him. And nobody, are you crazy? Are you sure, Joe, looking? Because when he stood up and gave his testimony, everybody will be cheering and, and say, wow, thank you, Jesus. And it was powerful. I, I, it was real. But I saw, I, I don't know why the, I see these gifts that the Lord gives me. I see in people, and I always saw as a, as a black dot. It's the only way I could explain it, and it grows. And I saw this demon, and I even went to him. And he, th he brushed me off. He goes, are you kidding me? I go, I serve Jesus. I said, I know, I know. I tried everything. I gave up. So anyways, he gets violent where I said, okay, separate. So what happened was I, I churches used to invite me and I will go visit churches. I will go visit other churches. So this night was not a regular service at what the pastor's church and the apostolic. So the pastor and the pastor's wife, they're elderly and they're having dinner and he's there. He gets up because the pastor, I'll tell you, he gets up, he goes and he gets a knife and he pulls out the knife. And he shows the knife to the right in front of him, right in the kitchen. The pastor wife and the, and the pastor and the pastor wife. He goes, I am going to kill 
jaw. I'm going to stab him to death. And they saw this man pull out the knife in front of them. And the fear, can you imagine? It breaks my heart because they were elderly. The fear, I mean, he could have killed them. You know, thank Jesus he protected the pastor and the pastor's wife. So the pastor gets up and his wife goes in the room and he locks the door. And the pastor's waiting for me at the front door. He gets late. Remember, I went to another church. So I always walked and I got there maybe around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And remember, we shared a room together. Me and this man, we shared the room. So now they know, now, but it's too late. Now the pastor knows I'm telling the truth. And remember, if you backside, you become seven times worse than you were before. It's in the Bible, in the New Testament. You become seven times worse. Now, if you heard my testimony, this man was pure evil, obedient to Satan, and he did horrific things to people without hesitation. So now he's seven times worse. And the pastor sees the demons. Now he's scared. He's in the house. He could kill the pastor and the pastor's wife. So I walk home to the pastor because I live with the pastor. I'm homeless. I walk in. The pastor comes and grabs me. He goes, I need to sit, sit down right here in, in the living room. Sit down and talk. And I could tell something happened. He goes, Brother Joe, I got to tell you what happened. And he tells me. What happens? And he's, you could see the fear. And, and, and listen, we're human. When you go through dramatic events, I've been through a lot. You're, you're human. You get scared. It's like, am I going to die tonight? So I saw the fear in the pastor. And I, I stopped the pastor. Let's pray. I prayed over the pastor. I said, Jesus, protect him, his wife, me. Look what the Lord is doing for me. And he's using the pastor. And I said, even for him, even though he turned, you know, I said, let nothing happen in this house. And I told the pastor, you're going to go in the room, lock the door. Don't come out for any reason tonight, any reason. And he goes, Brother Joe, please sleep here on the couch. He goes, I'm scared for your life. You go in that room. And this whole time, I keep thinking, wow, he could actually just come around and start killing me right there because he's in that room right there. So I said, okay, Pastor. I, so the pastor goes in the room, locks it, gives me a blanket, and I lay on the, in the, in the living room couch. And I have to pray through now because now I know what this man can do. And now he's seven times worse. Now it's too late. Nobody Now they know the truth. And I kept... I closed my eyes and I kept waking up thinking this man standing over me or uh, waking up to someone stabbing me because I know what the devil can do. And I'm like, oh, I had to pray through. I wake up scared. I'm like, all right, Jesus, just protect me, protect me, protect this house. So I didn't really sleep really well that night. And so when I finally woke up, I didn't know the pastor got up early and took that man to a hotel paid for three nights. And when he dropped him off, he told the pastor this. He goes, tell Joe, after Sunday night service, which is coming up, I'm going to stab him and kill him to death. And he told the pastor stern, and he knew, and, and people knew when he says, you knew it was from the pits of hell. So he dropped him off. He came straight home, and he comes to me, and he goes, Brother Joe, he was scared. For me, for my life. He goes, Brother Joe, uh, is there any family members? Uh, I'll take you anywhere. He will take me to Fresno, to LA. He will take me anywhere because I was in Tulare, California. He goes, I'll take you anywhere. He was, because they know this man. Not only that he backs like he's seven times worse and they know how he was before. Oh my gosh. Now he's, so, and I go, Pastor, I don't have, this was before cell phones. <laughs> this was before cell phones and, and no laptops and no such thing. So I didn't have anything. I remember I only had a bag of clothes and I didn't have no book. I, I didn't have nothing. I I didn't I, I lost contact with my parents. And so I haven't seen them or know where they're at for over two years. And at that time. They were living in Arizona. I didn't know. I, I had no idea. And the pastor goes, do you have any family members? 
I know I have a lot of families in Fresno, but I don't have no relationship or numbers or address to anybody, not one single person. So, and the pastor goes, what are you going to do, Brother Joe? And I says, you know, pastor, I have the keys to the church. Also, I'll lock up after Sunday night service. I won't let him kill me in the front yard of the lawn. I'll go in the street and let him kill me. And I says, I don't have nothing. I said, I, I'm homeless. I don't really have anything. I'll go home and be with Jesus. And he goes, why, Brother Joe? Why? And, and, and he did take me. He took me to the church to stay there for the because he was afraid that man was going to come to the house and kill me in that house. So he put he took me for the to the church for the rest of the week because he was scared for my life. And now here comes Sunday morning, and everybody finds out. So after Sunday service, because church was from 10 to 12, so after 12, everybody started coming to me. Everybody started coming. Oh, Brother Joe, we heard what's, what's going on. And I, oh, it was too late. What can I say? And, and I had nowhere to go. And everybody kept asking me, where are you going to go? And I kept telling people, I have nowhere to go. I go, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to let him kill me. And people thought I was crazy. I want to go home. Where <laughs> He's going to kill me. He, it's not like, well, maybe he should. No, it's going to happen. As people were talking to me, I'm in the nursery room and people are, and I, I'm saying the same thing over and over. And I see two people staring at me. And I look at them and I go, wow, that, that looks like my parents. And through the glass window, my mom goes, Mio? And I go, mom? She runs around and grabs me and she's holding me and she's crying. The pastor's right there. Other people are like, they go, who's that? Brother Joe, I go, and she's holding me. She's hugging me. I go, this is my mom? <laughs> like, uh, I was, and she's holding me and she's crying. And my stepdad's right there. You know, he, he don't say nothing. And my mom was crying, and she goes, mijo, for over a week. She goes, every time I close my eyes or I went to sleep, I see this man stabbing you to death. She goes, I can't sleep. I can't take it no more. And she goes, we live in Phoenix, Arizona. And she goes, I had to come and find you. And, and the pastor's looking at me. I look at the pastor, and she sees my look. I look at the pastor because that Sunday night, I'm going to get stabbed to death. And my mom goes, what? I go, this is it's supposed to happen tonight. My mom goes, this is real? I go, yeah. Tonight, I am supposed to get murdered and stabbed to death. Exactly what you saw. That's exact. And the pastor goes, Jesus is saving you, Brother Joe. And my mom goes, mijo. We're, we're going to Fresno for three days and visit family, which, you know, I don't know very well. We're going to go visit family, and we're coming straight to Arizona. And the pastor goes, Jesus is saving you. Jesus is saving you. And my mom goes, come. I can't let you get killed. I can't sleep. I can't. I, I said, okay. All I had was a bag of clothes. I grabbed the bag. Pastor couldn't wait to get me in the van when my parents came. because And then what the, I didn't tell you is, they, when they went to, to Larry, they didn't know where I was at. Remember, no, there's no cell phone. No, I had no contact with my parents for two years. They knew I always went to church. So they went to the church and they waited till after service was out. When people started leaving, they went inside the church to look for me. And there I was, this is old Jesus. And, and not only that, when I went in the van, the pastor was so high. He was like, he goes, brother, just go. And I said, thank you. I was telling the pastor, thank you. What about you? He goes, don't worry. He goes, you're welcome. God bless Jesus saving you. And when you could see the relief on the pastor. Remember, they're elderly. They know what's happening. And they know firsthand. And he knows what the guy told the pastor, what he was going to stab me to death. When I got in the van and we left, the pastor was so relieved. Went to Fresno for three days. And then that we came straight to Arizona. Jesus, Jesus brought me here. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. That was because of Jesus. I've been here. Jesus saved my life. Literally. 
over and over and over in my life. And he used my mom. They didn't know where I was at. He gave my mom. Did my mom serve Jesus? No, they didn't serve Jesus. Jesus will use anybody who, like I said before, a tree, a donkey. He'll use a sinner to save you, to help you. And Jesus is beautiful and amazing. That's why I love Jesus. He's everything. He's my king. And I only say, Lord, mighty Jesus Christ. And that's how I came to Arizona, Jesus. And anybody asks me, I tell them the truth. My wife one time asked me, she goes, aren't you ever kind of uh, afraid of people not believing? I say, I, I know it's going to be hard to believe, but I'm going to tell them the truth because that's how I came. Jesus saved my life and brought me to Arizona. You know, so interesting. You said that how your wife asked you, are you nervous? People will be, you know, won't believe you. But one thing I mm. like to go by is no matter what, if you tell them your testimony, if it sounds wild enough, which a lot of times <laughs> it does, right? They don't forget it. And then they always mm. come back to what you said. And then they realize, oh my goodness, Joe was right. You know, so, I mean, is the Lord's, is the Lord's, is the Holy Spirit's job to convict and it's our job to, to witness. So I think it's amazing. Now, so back to that guy, what caused him to have an about face? Um, you mean what, to backslide? Is that what you yeah. mean? Okay, okay. Well, this is what I try to tell people. When, when you have a demon, a spirit, and it grows, and it takes it over, and that's what it was. The spirit was attached to him. He got baptized, received the Holy Ghost, and all that. But what happened is he wasn't fully delivered. And the problem is he needed that deliverance. And that's why a lot of people, and it's true and it's sad, a lot of people come to Jesus and then what happens? Sometimes it takes a couple months, a year, and they backslide. And they, and they go, what happened? You were on fire. You were preaching. You were doing outreach. It's because they were never fully delivered. And that demon grows and grows and grows. And it takes over where that man is struggling behind closed doors. And he doesn't ask for help. He doesn't know how to reach Jesus. He doesn't know how to do anything. And they allow, because they, a lot of times people feel pressure. Okay, I'm this person, so I got to act. No, we're all human. This is why I tell everybody, you need to repent. Get yourself out of the way. Ask Jesus to show you, is there anything inside of me? Is there anything that is not of you any way, shape, or form? In the name of Jesus Christ, rebuke it out in the name of Jesus Christ. Me and my wife do that every day, every morning. We do say, Jesus, please search us because you never know. And like I said before, they're not going to say, hey, I'm right here. Hey, no. <laughs> It's everything is in secrecy. Everything is subtle and they're quiet. But what, that's why Jesus has people that, that serve them and they have gifts to help you. But a lot of times people don't listen. And that, that's so for that guy, that's what happened. Nobody listened to me. Remember, I try to help him. I try to go to the pastor, Mr. And they all, all of them rejected me. I would go to they're like, brother, Joe, are you sure? I'm not even forget it. I told Jesus I tried. I tried. And there was nothing to do. It, and then it was too late. So did he mention, I, cause I know the first interview you said he wanted to kill you because the devil told him to, he was walking down mm -hmm. the street and he just told him to, what was his reasoning this time for wanting to kill you and even scheduling a day afterwards? Yeah. Well, I never spoke to him. Remember? So remember, so when I came that night and he, after he told the pastor and he grabbed the knife and told the pastor and the pastor's wife right in front of them that he was going to stab me to death. I never spoke to him again. I never saw him again. So that night when I, after I prayed for the pastor, the pastor went to the room. I went to sleep. When I woke up, they were gone. They were already gone. And he took them to a hotel. And, and then he, the, the evil man, told the pastor he was going to stab me to death after Sunday night service because he knew I went to all the services. And he knew exactly where I was going to be at. So I never spoke to him. I, I When the demons take over and you're seven times worse, you can change just like that because there's no Jesus. It's gone. And he was obedient. And he remember. He wanted to kill me because the Satan ordered him to kill me. Now he wanted to kill me because I serve Jesus and I, I only go by the past history 
I mean, and he's seven times worse. And now he wants to do the job that he that wasn't able to do. And that's the only way I could go by. And I just give all the honor and glory to Jesus for saving my life because I never saw him or spoke to him ever again. No, and I'm really happy that you mentioned that, you know, when a person becomes born again, they still need to be delivered from stuff. Yes. Uh, because people just think once they get saved, that's it. But it's still, <laughs> yes. still gook and gobbledygoo up in there that yes. needs to be taken out. So yes. thank you for mentioning that. So, okay, so yes. how did everybody at church find out? And did they try to stop him? Because you said everybody found out. Yeah. He didn't tell them why. He just said, I'm going to kill Joe. Yeah. So what happened was the pastor was scared for my life. I mean, I felt really bad for because they're elderly. And I think he, I believe this is the only way I could, I I think he was calling members of the church. Hey, can someone help Brother Joe? He's, and I believe he was telling everybody, hey, this man turned, he's going to kill Brother Joe. And I think he was telling, and plus the wife was probably telling other sisters what happened because they saw it firsthand. When he pulled the knife, he said, I'm going to stab Joe to death. They saw the devil and they started telling, by warning people to stay away from this man. They're scared because this man is very evil. So when I went to church, I was shocked. People were coming up to me. Hey, we heard what happened. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't talk to nobody. So that's the only way I would assume is the pastor's wife, the pastor were calling people and warning people, trying to help me also. And that's what I believe. Wow. And then how long was the drive for your mother? Cause she drove, you said, just for you she so that's she still so she has that mother love still because i know you're like yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard but so yeah. how long was the drive from phoenix arizona to where you were was it fresno yes yeah oh no it's tulare california okay so from here to over there in a car and just not including brakes gas it's an eight to nine hour drive but if you take more time it could be or you get tired you pull over you can sleep or or uh, it, the gas it could be even longer and depending what route you use la traffic i'm telling you i i have many experiences of traveling back and forth so so you're easily looking at i would say for them probably 10 plus hours to drive all the way to to tulare california wow and from there you just hopped on a car and went back yeah, uh, I went. Well, what happened was when I left it, when I came out to church, I said goodbye to the pastor of God and, and we drove straight to Fresno and we visited family for three days. And then we drove straight to Tulare. We didn't stop in Tulare anywhere in here because they knew what happened. But, so they drove straight to, uh, you know, here. Of course, that doesn't include, you know, gas and food and all that. But we didn't stop in Tulare. I'll tell you that. Wow. And how many years has it been since you left California? That was, uh, if I remember right, 90, um, 96. I just turned 21. Yeah, so my math, my wife will help me on the math. So I think it was 96. Okay. I, I moved and then I turned 21. Wow. So 96. Wow. That was, have you been back since? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been, uh, I, I was a truck driver. And I and uh, when I was a truck driver, I used to go in, and go out and visit my parents and you know uh go up there and people like oh you want to go meet uh -uh. i didn't want to meet nobody from my past <laughs> i uh, i'm glad nobody knew where i was going i stopped at a truck stop and i visit my parents and get back and take off i didn't want to see nobody <laughs> so have you heard anything so have you heard anything about i know you've been spoken to him but have you heard anything about the man who tried to kill you multiple times have you heard anything you know, I've never heard a thing. I also thought about well, maybe I should Google him because I figure he's either dead or prison or both. But I never did. I, I leave everything in Jesus' hands and he he saved my life. And I don't like look what Jesus did. It's like you said, I have faith. Faith without works is dead. I leave everything. If Jesus is for us, who could be against us? I leave everything. I'm not going to try to look through the past, look up somebody. I don't have, like I said, I don't have no social media. I don't have Facebook or any of that. Stuff. So I don't do any of that stuff. I just follow Jesus and I just leave everything in his hands. And, and I heard nothing. I know nothing. If he's alive or dead or I, I know nothing. 
Amen. He's protected you. And I believe your life is a perfect example and a perfect mm-hmm. representation for how our lives are supposed to be. And if we just take mm-hmm. down, you know what? It's the fact that something happens when we get older, where the devil likes to take away our childlike faith. Um, mm-hmm. Because when you're a kid, you can't tell a kid anything because they just believe. And you yes. still hold on to that, which I think a lot of viewers love about you. And they mention your childlike <laughs> you. faith all through the comments. Yes. Um, you can see it on you. It's, a, it's a holy innocence. And I believe that's what we all should have because with that comes protection, provision, blessings, and miracles as your life um, shows. So Joe, you have your own podcast now. What's it called and how can we find you? Yes. After I got up the first time with you on the Deep Believer, the, the Lord led my wife to start a podcast and it's absolutely from Jesus. It's on Spotify. It's absolutely free. It's called Lord Mighty Jesus Christ and also Google Podcasts, all free. The name of it is Lord Mighty Jesus Christ. And it's for Jesus. It's for anybody that needs to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I get in depth in my personal live testimonies because i can't say everything on here i i keep it very personal and uh, it's for you and there you go amen amen so everyone please subscribe and joe amen. could you please pray for our viewers amen amen okay in the name of jesus christ thank you so much jesus you know everything that i give my testimony and jennifer that allows me to come on here of deep believer is for the honor and glory for you jesus Lord, there's so many people that are hurting, so many people that are going through abuse or sexual or anything that's horrific, or people are the one to commit suicide, or people are depressed. Even when they go to church, Jesus, have them to, to call on your name in the name of Jesus Christ. Say, Jesus, I'm hurting. Are you real? They need you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let them know how amazing, how much I love you, Jesus, because when they feel your love, it will change their life. It will, you will heal their minds, their body, and their soul, and they'll be sold out for you, Jesus. You said the harvest is full, but the labors are few, and I appreciate, bless Jennifer that, that allow me to come on here, Lord, but it's for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. It's not mine. It's for you, Jesus. Let them see you let them hear you touch every man woman and child let them know that they could call on your name name jesus jesus help me jesus i need you now in the name of jesus christ i love you jesus amen amen joe sanchez once again thank you for sharing your amazing miraculous testimony yes thank you so much thank you